Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Earth Energy and Environment E3 Conference and Exhibition. Thank you for joining us today on the first day of Earth Energy and Environment E3 Conference and Exhibition's third year, year 2023. I have the pleasure to be here with you this afternoon med moderating this session, and I would like to start off by introducing myself. My name is Shumana Tariq Abdurazik. I have both my bachelor's and master's in petroleum engineering. In this session, we convene to unravel the intricate dynamics that govern the behavior of Earth's subsurface materials. Geomechanics, a field at the intersection of geology and engineering, delves into the mechanical properties of rocks and geological formations. This session promises to take you on a journey through the principles and applications of geomechanics, offering a profound understanding of how these materials respond to the forces exerted, exerted upon them. From testing the stability of underground structures to optimizing resources. The insights gleaned from geomechanics affect various industries and disciplines. By the end of our session, I trust you'll leave with an appreciation for the profound impact that geomechanics has not only on petroleum engineering, but also on resource management and other environmental aspects. This session is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, Pi Petro, where you can also find all of our previous and upcoming sessions in Earth Energy and Environment Student Conference and Exhibition. On our YouTube channel, again, that's Pi Petro. Please allow me to welcome our keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Mark Zoback from Stanford University. Good afternoon, Dr. Zoback. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're so glad to have you here. Well, I'm glad to be participating. Okay. Um, well, the title of my presentation today uh, is uh, The Geomechanical Challenges of, of Massive Scale CO2 Sequestration. And uh, just to make clear uh, what I mean by massive scale, is this, this slide um, is a little dated. It first appeared in 2017, uh, but the numbers are, are representative uh, and perhaps even a bit modest. So this is how much uh, CO2 uh, needs to be stored in billions of tons, gigatons per year. It is not, as it appears to be, a cumulative plot. Every, it, instead, it, it represents how much has to be stored every year. So it's the increase in the annual storage. So for example, if we're going to, if uh, CO2 storage in the subsurface is going to may, uh, play a significant role in reducing greenhouse gases, it should be functioning at about a gigaton a, a year, a billion tons of supercritical CO2 per year by sort of the end of this decade. Um, by uh, about 2038 or so, we, we've got to be operating at about 3.3 3 .3 billion tons or so. That's that's a volume of fluid that's equivalent to global oil production. So, you know, by talking about a billion tons of CO2, it's a little bit hard to get your head around what that really means. But I think everybody has an intuitive idea of the size of the global oil industry, a couple million producing wells, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of pipelines, tens of thousands of facilities. Um, and and you know it's just an enormous undertaking in a, in a very short period of time. Um, by uh, mid-century, we've got to be at about twice that level. Where are we now? Well, we're storing globally about 30 million tons of CO2 per year, anthropogenic CO2 that is, uh, from man-made sources. And it doesn't even get us above uh, the horizontal line. So we've got a long, a long way to go. It has been recognized for a long time that there are multiple ways of storing CO2 in the subsurface, but the two big sinks, the two possible sources that allow us to think at large scale are to use saline aquifers, sedimentary formations at depth, which are just filled with uh, saline water, which has, of course, no economic value, uh, and depleted oil and gas reservoirs. And I'm going to focus on those two topics today. Uh, there are four, four main things I want to talk about. I want you to understand induced seismicity and interplate seismicity uh, to um, understand this challenge that I'm talking about. Uh, and then I'll <clears throat> talk about um, all of the earthquakes that have been, you know, triggered by the injection of large amounts of, of water. Um, this is produced water from oil and gas activities. 
and it serves as an analog an analog for you know injecting large volumes of uh, supercritical CO2. Then I'll talk about the two uh, most well-known ongoing projects in North America, a project at Decatur, Illinois, and a project at Quest, the Quest project in Alberta, and then finally conclude with uh, options for, for moving forward. So let's just get started. Um, the first thing I want to say about the physics of induced seismicity is that these injection-induced earthquakes represent the triggered release of existing strain energy on already stressed faults in a critically stressed crust. And you'll see what that means in a minute. But the important idea here is that the energy that will be released in, in, a, in an earthquake is already in the earth. It's the result of natural geologic processes. And the earthquake that's being triggered by fluid injection would someday have happened in the future. And that, what does the future mean? Well, for intraplate earthquakes, where, which occur relatively rarely, and it might have been a thousand years in the future or 10,000 years in the future. But the energy is already in the earth. And then the pressure increase that results from fluid injection reduces the effect of normal stress on these faults and it allows them to slip today rather than at some time in the future. So you're not putting the energy in you're actually triggering the release of existing energy. Now, to look at this uh, sort of globally and to understand what we normally call uh, induced earthquakes, uh, the, you know, the term triggered is much more uh, relevant for the reasons I just stated, but the terms are used sort of interchangeably. But it's a, important to recognize that we live on a critically stressed crust. What does that mean? It means earthquakes occur nearly everywhere. Uh, the, obviously, this is a map of um, the eastern U.S. and southeastern Canada. Some areas have more earthquakes than others. But um, even in relatively stable areas, uh, these red dots represent places where dams have been built, water has been impounded behind the dam, and a small pore pressure change at depth triggers the uh, has triggered an earthquake. We see that on the you know Canadian Shield, you know extremely stable area. In the Indian Shield, an extremely stable area. We see it in eastern China, whereas you know the western western China is you know very active uh, seismically. Uh, eastern China is relatively inactive, and yet we see various sites of reservoir induced seismicity. So, you know. A very small pore pressure change is inducing the seismicity because it's releasing energy that's already in the earth. So in these stable areas, the stress is high. The deformation rate is low. That's why we have relatively few earthquakes. So the way to think about this in terms of lithospheric dynamics is the forces that are driving plate motion are transmitted through the plates. The... Um, uh, upper layer is brittle, depending on the local, you know, thermal gradient, but typically to about, about 16 kilometers, we have brittle deformation. And then we have steady state ductile deformation in the lower crust and the upper mantle. So the lithospheric plates are pretty solid, but as they move, they are deforming slowly and they're just deforming slowly through ductile deformation in the lower crust and upper mantle, but the brittle crust deforms through earthquakes. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. These earthquakes that are occurring as a natural geologic process, which are then accelerated by the uh, fluid injection. Now, these stresses that drive, you know, that are driving the plates and are transmitted through the plates can be mapped. And I've been involved in these activities now for some 40 years. And here's a, a map of the central and eastern United States. The directions indicate the direction of the maximum stress. The colors represent how compressional the, the state of stress is. Uh, there's a scale here. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but the you know central part of um, the continent here of the U.S. here in Colorado is more or less a normal faulting environment, becomes more strike-slip, and mo moves to a strike-slip reverse faulting environment um, as we go further east. Uh, this pattern was evident in the very first stress map we produced. My wife and I published in 1980. Um, but the data were very, very poor, and the data are much, much better now. And for example, you can see a very consistent direction of, 
a maximum horizontal stress here, which is plays an important role in, in optimizing the development of unconventional resources. You have to drill horizontal wells in the right direction. Uh, we are doing a lot of work on induced seismicity and other things in the Permian Basin. It's a very interesting uh, place geologically and from the state of stress. The Midland Basin has relatively uniform, almost east-west compression. It's sort of a strike-slip normal faulting area. As you go further west, the stresses are less compressive. It's more or less a normal faulting area. And we see a very, <clears throat> excuse me, distinct rotation from sort of north south compression that rotates clockwise to more or less east-west compression and then keeps rotating to northwest southeast compression each one of these lines represents numerous observations in a single wellbore and the longer the line or the highest quality data there might be hundreds of observations and every wellbore is independent of every other wellbore so there's just a tremendous amount of data and um it, it it's you know it's pretty straightforward here. It's very complicated here, but we can map the stress field and use what we map in making decisions and understanding, for example, uh, induced seismicity, as I'll be demonstrating later. Now, if you uh, read what the Department of Energy has to say, uh, there's really no problem. There's so much capacity in saline aquifers that the need to store huge quantities of CO2 should be no problem. And they're shown in outline here. Um, the problem is, is that the approach here is to take area times thickness times porosity um, and equate that to uh, capacity, pore volume. Each of these sites will require extensive site characterization, which is going to take time and money. All will need to meet rigorous regulatory and monitoring requirements, which are not fully developed. Many will not work for you know, good geologic reasons. The permeability will be too low or there, there are other issues, but poor volume does not equal capacity. And there's an appreciable risk of induced seismicity, which is what I wanna uh, talk about today. So let's look at these examples of produced water injection as an analog for CO2 injection. And I'm gonna start by talking about basal aquifer injection injection into a geologic formation that's sort of at the bottom of a sedimentary sequence and lying directly upon crystalline basement. If you look at um, earthquakes uh, for over about the past 25 years, uh, magnitude three and larger, as you can see in the uh, central and eastern US, uh, any earthquake that would have occurred would have been detected by the national network. So it's a pretty complete catalog. Things were going along pretty uniformly, earthquakes popping off uh, from time to time until around 2009. And we see a very marked increase in, in seismicity uh, starting in about 2009, 2010. If you subtract Oklahoma from this, what you can see is there's been an increase in seismicity, but it's not nearly so striking. So Oklahoma is uh, really an exception. And Oklahoma is the place that really uh, got us looking at this phenomenon of produced water injection uh, very carefully. So in 2013, I was invited to brief the governor on uh, what was happening in Oklahoma. And I titled my presentation, The Curious Case of Oklahoma Seismicity, uh, because of, uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the movie that was was out uh, with uh, Brad Pitt, if you remember it, um, about a curious case. But more importantly, because induced seismicity was normally the case of an earthquake occurring in a place where they're relatively rare, something happening in that same area, and, for example, an injection well. And then you're trying to answer the question, you know, is it a coincidence or was it causal? Did the injection cause the earthquake? What happened here and made it so curious is we've never seen anything like the whole state lighting up at the same time. The Earth, so here's the scale, 100 kilometers. So you know it's a couple hundred kilometers from one, you know, one end to the other, and at the same time there was a lots of produced water injection going on at all these blue X's. Those are saltwater injection wells, which I'll talk about in a minute. The black X's are where water flooding, um, just water being put back into the produced 
the the uh, formation that produced it. Um, so that's kind of a, a cyclic pro- process. You take oil and water out, and you put the water back. The blue are areas where the water is being injected uh, into a saline aquifer, not into the producing zone. This is what that picture looks like today. And uh, if you look at the time scale here, you know anything that's sort of this um, medium colored, this light red and dark red are you know things that have happened since you know 2012. And of course, it's just you know Oklahoma has been incredibly, incredibly active as as the previous um, map also showed. After fixing a couple thousand errors in the water disposal database, uh, my former student, Raul Walsh, and I uh, wrote a paper uh, discussing the, the origin of these earthquakes. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, speculation. They were caused by hydraulic fracturing. Uh, they're not. They were re- really occurring due to the injection of very, very large volumes of produced water into the Arbuckle Formation, a thick, porous, and permeable saline aquifer sitting right on top of crystalline rock. So oil prices were high. A couple of uh, very entrepreneurial companies realized they could go back to formations like the Mississippi Lime, the Hunton Limestone, and they could produce them, and they could produce oil if they had a way of, you know, disposing of the water because they were you know, very strong water producers. So what these companies did is they drilled large diameter, high volume injection wells down into the Arbuckle Formation so that when the production wells were drilled, it was just a matter of separating the oil and water and taking it to the disposal wells, which were already in place. So all those blue X's uh, on on the map were wells like, like this. In fact, the Arbuckle is slightly subhydrostatic so in fact the water would be flowing in under under its own weight they wouldn't even have to pump it in um however because so much water was put in 700 million barrels in 2014 alone for example um the pressure built up in the arbuckle not a lot of pressure and i'll show that here in the next slide not a lot of pressure but that pressure built up and spread out over this whole area of north central oklahoma and southern kansas and that pressure was transmitted down permeable faults into the crystalline basement and the earthquakes were occurring about four kilometers you know below that interface the injection was up here the earthquakes as you can see are down there And these are the critically stressed faults uh, that I was talking about. And relatively small pressure changes was all that was needed to uh, stimulate slip on these these many faults in this old crystalline basement. Uh, From a a paper that um, Cornelius Langenbroek, Matt Weingarten and I uh, published a few years ago, we put a hydrologic model um, into our analysis the hydrologic model um, was uh, calibrated. Uh, the only real heterogeneity we used uh, was the Nemohoff fault here. It was a flow barrier because it's a major geologic feature going all the way up into you know, Nebraska. And, um, and what you can see is the injection on the east side caused these earthquakes that are to the east of the Nemohoff fault. And the injection on the west side caused these earthquakes here. And the correlation between where the earthquakes are and where the pressure change is, is very good. Now, this is the pressure change that we're estimating at the depth of the earthquakes, roughly uh, six and a half kilometers below the surface. And that pressure change is 0.2 megapascals or 30 PSI. So it's a very small pressure change. And yet it triggered an earthquake as large as a magnitude 5.1. 5.8. Well, what Raul and I did was we showed this correlation and it was kind of indisputable. And then the um, the regulators toward the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016, mandated reductions in the injection volumes. And what happened is that the earthquakes started to diminish quite rapidly. So on in this, in this figure, the gray shows the injection rate. 
The red shows the pressure rate at change because there's a delay in the uh, pressure you know, being transmitted to depth. But the green is showing the seismicity and the, si and the, um, the uh, spiky nature is because you know, you're not only injecting, uh, ejecting, you're not only uh, triggering say a 5.7, you're triggering lots of aftershocks. So the number of earthquakes goes up. And so what you can see is shortly after the injection rate increase, the pressure increases, but as soon as the uh, pressure started to decrease, okay, the red line, the earthquakes began to decrease very, very sharply. So that's why in this plot that I showed before, when we look at the national seismic seismicity, it went up because of Oklahoma, and then it came down very rapidly because of Oklahoma, stopping this uh, basal injection. Well, let me talk about another kind of a triggered earthquake, and I, I call this strata-bound injection. And what's happening in the Delaware Basin, the westernmost part of the uh, Permian Basin in West Texas and southern New Mexico, is earthquakes that are limited in depth to the injection zone. In this case, the injection zone is this Delaware mountain group, this uh, kind of yellowish, uh, yellowish green, I guess it is, and this green formation just below it, the Bone Spring. Most is into the uh, Delaware mountain group, some is into the Bone Spring. Okay, And if you look here, what you can see with the, um, the red histogram here, is that the you know the earthquakes are occurring at the same depth as the injection? There's salt above. The overpressured uh, Wolf Camp is below. So the earthquakes are strata bound. They're not going down into the basement as was the case in Oklahoma. And the pressure change. This is work from the Bureau of Economic Geology uh, at the University of Texas. The uh, the pressure changes. You know sometimes there is you know large as um, you know, 100 PSI or more. Uh, but in many cases, we're getting earthquakes where the pressures are much, much lower. And in fact, um, scientists at the Bureau have documented cases where it appears as if, you know, 10 or 20 PSI was enough to trigger earthquakes, which is pretty amazing. Now, so we have these two kinds of earthquakes. And how well do we understand them? Well, if we understand the state of stress, using those kinds of maps I showed you before, um, the occurrence of induced seismicity is easily understood. Unfortunately, we often understand this only in retrospect, but there are things we can do in advance as well, as I'll show you. For example, these earthquakes um, in, the, in the Delaware Basin are occurring on normal faults that are striking absolutely parallel to the direction of maximum horizontal stress as should be the case. You can open any geological, uh, structural geology textbook, normal faults uh, are expected to act with the SH max parallel to the fault, um, SH min per perpendicular to the fault, and SV is the biggest stress. And that's exactly what's happening here. And as the stress rotates, these uh, uh, focal plane mechanisms illustrate that the planes are, that are slipping is all, you know, are also rotating just as uh, just as expected. So it all kind of fits with what we know from Coulomb faulting theory. And so we've developed some software at Stanford called Fault Slip Potential. And it says that if you know the state of stress and you know the orientation of the fault, you can predict the poor pressure needed to uh, make it slip. And that's what the color here on the left side indicates you know, with respect to these uh, various faults that have been mapped by previous previous workers. And in Oklahoma, we can't see the faults because they're all down in the basement. But the figure on the left is a map of seismicity made by Young Su Park, a, a former PhD student at Stanford working with Bill Ellsworth and Greg Barroza. And they're using sort of AI techniques to you know, improve the earthquake catalog. And what you, there's something like 90,000 earthquakes here. And when you zoom in, you can see the planes, you know, that the earthquakes are occurring on very, very clearly. And if you plot the orientation of the planes, Oklahoma is in a strike slip faulting environment. 
Uh, here's the biggest earthquake, the Pawnee earthquake on this fault, and there's a bunch of aftershocks on that fault. These are the conjugate strike-slip faults that one would expect. We, the state of stress here is um, um, compression at about north 85 east. It's a very uniform stress field. And you know, just as would be seen in a, a textbook, such as one of mine, uh, is exactly what we see in nature. Coulomb folding theory works very well. FSP is a, a free to the public. We developed it at Stanford. Uh, we were approached by Exxon. They were developing a similar program, and we wound up releasing it together as a as a, a joint exercise. Uh, uh, Stanford and Exxon uh, released press releases on the same day. You can put in, you know, the uh, the faults that you know about, the injection wells. You can do some radial flow, but you can import a better, you know, whatever hydrologic model you have. It'll do the geomechanical analysis. And then it will show you, you know, for any given fault, for example, what the po p potential for slip is as a function of the pore pressure increase. And finally, we'll show you which which numbers in the analysis were most important. Well, I retired from Stanford two and a half years ago. My students, you know, are all gone. And so um, we're very appreciative. The, uh, the CISR program uh, uh, at the Bureau of Economic Geology, uh, along with TexNet at the Bureau, are taking over maintenance and uh, making this aware, uh, making this available to the public. In fact, it's going to be uh, made into a, uh, a web app uh, soon. So if you're interested in this software, it's available to you. Now, the next point I want to make about the physics of induced seismicity is not intuitive. Um, and, and that is that the maximum magnitude of injection-induced earthquakes depends on the size of the critically stressed fault that slips, not the magnitude of the pressure change that triggered the slip. For example, the 5.8 um, Pawnee earthquake in Oklahoma appears to have been triggered by a pore pressure change of, um, you know, on the order of 10 to 20 PSI. You know, it's a very small pore pressure change. It's the size of the fault that slips. Now, this figure looks a little bit complicated, but it's really pretty simple. It really sh it shows the um, magnitude of an earthquake as a function of the patch of the fault that slips. It's not the size of the fault. You know, the way to think about this is uh, the San Andreas fault is 700 kilometers long. It's, it's about uh, six kilometers from where I'm sitting, but it produces a million magnitude two earthquakes for every magnitude eight earthquake. So it's, you know, a small earthquake slips on a small patch of the fault and a bigger earthquake occurs on a bigger patch of the fault. So, if you want a magnitude 5.8 Pawnee earthquake, the fault has to be, you know, slipping over a dimension more than 10 kilometers in size. It has to be down in the basement. A magnitude three and a half earthquake, such as we get in the Delaware Basin, you know, that could uh, occur on a fault that's more like a kilometer or a few hundred meters in size. So we know that if we're really concerned about the hazard of induced earthquakes, inducing earthquakes in the basement is far more uh, problematic than, than inducing these strata-bound earthquakes. So the larger the area affected by pressure increases, the greater the likelihood of encountering a relatively large critically stressed fault. There are lots of small faults in the crust. There's fewer faults that are bigger and very few faults that are that are really big and oriented today in the appropriate orientation uh, to produce an earthquake in the current stress field. Now, this kind of relationship between the volume affected and the size of the earthquake has been noticed uh, by the um, seismological community. And this is a, a paper by Nick Vander Elts and others from the U.S. Geological Survey. It's following some ideas that have been in the literature for a while, but all of these blue squares represent the maximum size earthquake as a function of the injected volume. And it's very clear that while there's a lot of scatter in the data, it's a very uh, linear, it's log scale, um, a linear relationship between earthquake size 
and the injected fluid volume. And that's because there's just the probability increases as the volume affected increases of encountering a big fault. Okay, let's, let's look now at what's happening in the Illinois Basin and at Quest in Alberta. And I talk about this paper a lot. It was published uh, 13 years ago uh, by the group at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. At that time, we thought we would be relying on coal for electricity forever. There were 200 coal burning power plants along the Ohio River. And the, you know, the conceptual plan was to capture the CO2 from all these power plants and take it to the Illinois basin. And here are 20 wells that we're going to be injecting at high volume for a long period of time. Well, thankfully, um, you know, the shale gas revolution uh, obviated uh, the need for a lot of those coal burning plants. But the principles that were illustrated in this study are, yeah, that's really what I want to talk about. And one of the principles is that even with very high rate injections, so these are, this is after 50 years of injecting 100 million tons per year in 20 wells. So each well is 5 million tons a year. And after 50 years, the first thing you see is that the CO2 plume doesn't go very far. So here's the scale, right? Here's one side to the other is about 200 kilometers. So that's about 200 kil kilometers. So the, you know, from any given well, the, um, the CO2 plume is going maybe five or 10 kilometers. But the pressure, because you're displacing the fluid that's already you know, in the pores, the, that fluid pressure is increasing markedly over a very large area. Now, these are bars. A bar is 14 and a half PSI. Uh, 10 bars is one megapascal. So this 30 bar con you know, contour over a, about 200 you know, kilometers, that's three megapascals, that's 500 PSI, right? Um, uh, roughly. And, and so it's a very large pressure increase over a very large area. And that's, and that's the problem of injecting into these basal aquifers. If you actually look at what's been happening, they've been injecting a few hundred thousand tons a year uh, into the Mount Simon. The earthquakes are occurring on faults going down into the basement. So it's exactly the same story as Oklahoma, but the injection has been very modest. Very small amount of injection has been happening. The pressure change in the Mount Simon is less than a megapascal, similar to Oklahoma, and the earthquakes have been relatively um, minor. You know, uh, certainly not no felt earthquakes, nothing uh, comparable to a magnitude two, more like magnitude ones. But my fear is that as the volume increases, so will the seismicity. And yet, there are you know proposals. Um, this Navigator project, for example, this blue network you see here, was going to try to build a pipeline connecting corn ethanol plants and inject 15 million tons of CO2 per year. This uh, Wolf project was similar, uh, corn ethanol plants, and they wanted to take 12 million tons per year. So if you sum if those two projects happened, the amount of injection at Decatur would go up by a hundredfold. Okay, that's you know, that's not okay. Uh, you know, just assuming that um, you can scale up what's been done to depth, uh, to, done to date by a hundred x and uh, without any uh, negative consequences. And so these, um, you know. 45Q tax credits of $85 a ton, which are uh, were in the uh, IRA legislation, are, you know, they, you know, sequestering CO2 in the subsurface is a good idea. I want to see it succeed, but you can't just rush ahead uh, seeing dollar signs and just pick a site and, and say, we're just going to inject, you know, uh, in this case, 27 million tons uh, without expecting adverse consequences. An example of that uh, is the Quest project. This is outside of Edmonton. Uh, they're injecting CO2 uh, into this uh, basal Cambrian sandstone here. The earthquakes are down in the basement. It's about one and a half million tons here. So uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, considerably more. It's about well, not quite 1.3, 1. 1. 1.4 
uh, million, uh, about three or four times uh, what's happening at Decatur. And as one might expect, uh, since uh, you know 2015, when the injection started, everything was was more or less fine. And then around 2019, we get a magnitude three earthquake and a whole bunch of magnitude two earthquakes over this entire over this entire area. So a very large area is affected. The earthquakes are getting bigger, um, and you know magnitude three earthquakes are, are widely felt. Uh, do I think these trigger events are triggered by injection at Quest? Absolutely. And so Quest is up here in this huge. Uh, basal saline aquifer in the north central U.S. and south central Canada. And it's widely assumed that this is going to take hundreds of billions of tons. And I don't think it's going to do anything like that. And what we're talking about, you know, um, at Quest is exactly, and Decatur is exactly what we saw in the Dallas-Fort Worth Basin, where injection into the Ellenberger caused earthquakes in the basement. Uh, in Oklahoma, as I indicated a few minutes ago, and it's happening now in the Permian Basin. And if you actually look in detail at Oklahoma, this is the detailed data for three areas that Rawl and I considered in our 2015 paper, um, you can sort of see the threshold of injection. Uh, this is uh, millions of barrels per month, the threshold of injection that starts the seismic seismicity to go forward and basically, if you look at these three areas, um, each is 5,000 square kilometers, 50 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Imagine that these blue Xs are injecting supercritical CO2 and not saline water. You'd be injecting 3.7 to 7.5 million tons per year, quite a bit less than uh, people are talking about in some of these, uh, these projects that, uh, that sound good, but it, you know, that frankly, uh, in my opinion, can't be scaled up. So what do we do? How do we minimize the risk of induced seismicity and yet store CO2 in the subsurface? Well, Dirk Smit and I, Dirk is the chief scientist uh, for Shell. Uh, he and I wrote a paper uh, published earlier this year in which we made a strong case for triggering seismicity, triggering seismicity for injecting large volumes of CO2 into depleted oil and gas reservoirs to avoid triggering seismicity. We use Oman as an example. Shell has worked in Oman for a long period of time, there are hundreds of fields to choose from. Very sig significant amounts of both oil and gas production have occurred in the past. So why depleted oil and gas reservoirs? Well, there's a lot of knowledge of the subsurface, both static and dynamic that have been acquired since the uh, exploration, discovery, and production process began. Infrastructure is already in place. There's adequate pore space available. Uh, you removed a lot of <clears throat> hydrocarbons and one year of global oil production, remember, is equivalent to 3.4 gigatons per CO2. So if you look at depleted oil and gas reservoirs all around the world, it has tremendous capacity. Public acceptance is much easier. These are existing industrial sites. There's essentially no risk of induced seismicity due to the pressure depletion. And that's a very important point I'll return to in a minute. There are some cases where there have been earthquakes triggered um, at sites where CO2 is injected, but it always involves pre-existing faults, um, which need to be avoided. And it is sometimes hard to deconvolve because usually the CO2 injection follows years of water injection and so on. And it's, um, you know, can, can be complicated. But having a, you know, portfolio of fields allows you to choose the optimal sites. And there's, of course, a potential for positive impact on oil production through uh, CO2 uh, EOR. Some existing wells um, may pose leakage risk. Uh, there may be other infrastructure problems. So again, having a portfolio of fields tells you you can you know at least uh, you know select those that seem optimal. Here's an example that I've been talking about that makes the case uh, for depletion. 
The Delaware Mountain Group was a, a producing oil and gas field uh, for many years in, in the Delaware Basin. And the purple over here shows the production wells. The earthquakes that are being triggered by water injection are shown by the red dots. Where are the red dots? The red dots are where there were no, there were no producing wells. In other words, the red dots are where there's been no pressure depletion. Today, injection is occurring everywhere, but the only place injection is inducing earthquakes is where there has been no depletion. Where there has been depletion, the injection does not trigger earthquakes. So pressure is down. So when I talk about depletion, I mean pressure depletion, not depleted oil and gas, you know, not depletion of the oil and and gas that's present, but um, the pressure depletion. A good example of that is a project I did some consulting on in the Castor field in the Mediterranean. This is the coast of Spain. And Spain was badly in need um, of natural gas storage sites just to meet the need for, um, you know, the annual demand uh, and, you know, the increase in demand in the winter for heating. So this Castor field was a depleted field just offshore. And they tried injecting into the into the castor field. A few earthquakes occurred, and they stopped immediately. Why did not castor work? It didn't work because the pressure was depleted a couple hundred psi due to the production. But when the production tapered off and eventually stopped, a very strong water drive brought the pressure back up to the original level. So. Yeah, the oil and gas were depleted, but not the pressure. So that's a very uh, thing that can easily be checked. So what do we do? What are the best options for moving forward to minimize the risk of induced seismicity? Well, utilizing depleted oil and gas reservoirs, of course, I've already talked about. But the other is to go to a place where the saline aquifers are not likely to produce earthquakes. And these are the weakly cemented sands of the Gulf Coast region, both in Texas and Louisiana, as, as shown in these maps. And whether you're using a depleted reservoir in this area or a saline aquifer, it's relatively well characterized. The saline aquifers in the mid-continent have not been characterized because there was no reason, no economic reason to do it. But you know, in this region, the uh, exploration, the drilling, the logging, um, have all been penetrating many saline aquifers, um, and you know we, we have a lot of a lot of information of uh, uh, you know about them. Also, there are thick shale formations that provide seals both for upward and and downward flow. This is a cross section from some work we did off of South Eugene Island here, south of Louisiana, and all the blue are shales and the yellow are the uh, producing uh, sands. And so what you can see is they're very good seals. There are also growth faults, which we see here. These are aseismic faults, which are accommodating the load of, of sediments going, going into the Gulf. Um, and these can be problematic. They are, you know, they can potentially slip and uh, shear wells and do other things, but they're not going to cause earthquakes. They can be avoided, um, and through a you know a rigorous process of you know characterization, characterization and exploration, um, you know they th that that problem can be avoided. So there are some places that are very good to work. There are other places that are be problematic, and they have to be considered much more much more carefully. Um, I'm personally involved right now. In a uh, in a, a project to uh, produce decarbonized ammonia in the uh, Louisiana area, and a number of other companies are are involved in seeking you know saline aquifers in this area that will be suitable uh, for carbon storage, so that we can start decarbonizing uh, various uh, you know point sources uh, in in this region. So with that, I'll. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. There are certainly significant challenges. We can see the way ahead. And, you know, my, my entire premise is I want to see this succeed. I'm mostly afraid of public opinion. If the uh, public uh, 
uh, associates uh, carbon storage in the subsurface with earthquakes and is inherently dangerous, the public will prevent it from going forward and fulfilling its role in decarbonization. And I think it has a very important role uh, in decarbonization, but we have to do it right uh, for it to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zoback, for this uh, very enlightening session. Um, I had a quick question. Um, what's the risk of CO2 leakage into the aquifer um, during earthquakes? Well, that's, um, uh, I wrote a paper about that a decade ago. Um, <laughs> that's, that's one of the reasons you want to avoid, avoid the earthquakes, um, is that it could threaten the seal capacity. But frankly, um, and, you know, in the last 10 years, I would have, you know, I look back at that paper published in 2012, and I would publish the exact same paper again. But I'd say that the, the, the greatest risk when you're producing small earthquakes, not the bigger ones, you know, when you might be triggering faults in the basement, but the risk of small earthquakes is not the shaking, but is public opinion. We, we've seen, you know, the biggest gas, what well, was the biggest gas field? in Europe, the Groningen field in the Netherlands shut down because of a magnitude 3.6 earthquake, which is really too, too small to cause much damage. We've seen fracking shut down in you know, the Midlands of, of England because of magnitude, un, unfelt earthquakes, magnitude uh, less than, you know, they were less than two. And so um, public opinion, I think is, is the big issue, but of course, avoiding the larger earthquakes and avoiding basal injection is, 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 is the other issue I'm mostly concerned about. Thank you, Dr. Zerbeck. Uh, with this, we conclude our session for uh, uh, today. There, there, are se there are several other questions. Um, should I just read those and answer them in the chat box, or, or are we out of time? If we can do this, in like a, we have like maybe uh, three minutes. Also, yeah. I can copy the question and send it to you. Yeah, please answer some of those questions. Okay. Uh, is it possible to have these notes in PDF format after the session? I'd be happy uh, to provide it. Um, is the magnitude of the earthquakes depend on the amount of CO2 at the basement? I think basically, yes. You know, when we inject the CO2, it's in a supercritical form. So it's very much like water. It's about 60 you know, percent of the density of water. So it works just like a uh, saltwater injection. And so, you know, basically that's what controls the amount of CO2. And the final thing, certain regions with abundant hydrocarbon buildups appear to lack stress information and seismic data. Um, it does initially, but we've been, we've been mapping stress in sedimentary basins uh, around the world for, for many decades. And if you uh, don't have that data, it's it's easily uh, obtained. And seismic data, of course, is is routinely collected in these areas of uh, of oil and gas exploration. How much of it is in the public domain, of course, is a you know a valid question. But the, you know, I the data collection part uh, that underlies everything I said today is not research anymore. Um, it, 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 we we know how to do all that. We just have to do it. And uh, that can be easier or more difficult depending on the availability of the data. But we know the data is out there and we know what to do with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zubak. Thank you, Mark. My, my pleasure. Great to see you. Yeah. Right. Bye-bye.